Our next presenter is an archivist. She's a cultural historian, and she's the co-founder of the Prelinger Library, which is one of the great hidden gems of San Francisco. I really encourage you all to visit if you get a chance. Uh, she's written two books. The first chronicles the story of the space race, and her most recent book, Inside the Machine, uh, talks about the history of the electronics through art and advertising. Please welcome Megan Prelinger. Thanks, Norm. Wow, great, great to be here. Uh, this, tonight, my little show is a pocket history of space electronics. If we were going to do a full spectrum history of space electronics, it would cover telecommunications, instrumentation, uh, including navigation, telemetry, uh, flight systems, and then, of course, the ground-based systems, the flight systems, the ground-based systems. Um, but what I'm going to do tonight is uh, just do this pocket history and start out in the case of telecommunications, uh, speak for a moment about my method. Uh, and so while there is a history that links uh, radio communications, this is a French radio plane spotter from 1940, uh, with satellite telecommunications. Um, so while there is that history to be told, um, tonight, uh, what I'll explain for right here is just that what we're looking at is graphic art that was created to interpret new technologies when they were new, mostly for industry, and there's some uh, specifics that uh, take place when art is made for and about technology that makes it kind of different and interesting. It tells very specific technological stories, if you can suss them out. Uh, so I conduct historical research into the history of technology using the art as a kind of a, uh, a road map. And uh, as we see, there's a through line um, all the way through to the pure launchless, uh, pure science of radio astronomy uh, depicted here by Willie Baum. This is an artwork for Martin that he made in 1961. And uh, he's also the illustrator of these intertitles. In the case of instrumentation, uh, just another aspect of the method is to uh, talk about the life cycle of a technology, that uh, different technologies have phases of development, emergence, uh, phases of being integrated into pre-existing systems, helping to shape emerging systems, and then becoming mature. I'm going to uh, pick for tonight's uh, pickpocket history, the cathode ray tube, uh, cathode ray tubes, of course, serve hundreds of purposes. They're the antecedents of today's uh, television and computer monitors. Um, and here in 1940 is the introduction of the color tube uh, in a great art. This is, was in uh, Life or Fortune magazine. And um, uh, cathode ray tubes can also be engineered to be instruments of perception and behave like cameras. Uh, cheating here of, with a, some photographic evidence, because uh, I want to mention in the, the narrative cycle of the cathode ray tube, one of the high points, literally, was when a uh, Geiger counter to uh, tubes adapted to work as Geiger counters were put into stratospheric uh, conditions through a balloon launch in order to begin to monitor Earth's uh, magnetic sphere, and this was uh, part of the dawn of the application of space science to uh, Earth science and Earth uh, planetary geophysics and remote sensing. So, in another way, another point in the life story of the cathode ray tube, and this is kind of a funny one, uh, the first cathode ray tube to enter interplanetary space, as far as my historical research can tell, is the one that was equipped uh, with the Ranger 3 spacecraft uh, that was launched in 62 and uh, was to be a moon lander, but it missed its moon landing and went into the heliocentric orbit, meaning as a microplanet, it's uh, orbiting the sun. Uh, and when it got there, uh, it found a friend because the, the Soviet Union had had the same problem a couple of years earlier. And the, the Luna 1 lander was already there, keeping it ready to keep it company in the heliocentric orbit. Uh, uh, telemetry is uh, remote communication with a spacecraft's operational and scientific functions. And the uh, 
waypoint in the story of telemetry that I'm going to uh, speak on tonight is, is really what captivated the artists at the time, the introduction uh, in the early 1960s of pulse code modulation into telemetry. Pulse code modulation having been developed at Bell Labs by Claude Shannon, of course, to technology to expand the amount of information that any one communications channel can carry. And, uh, but PCM had a transformative impact on telemetry, and this little cluster of artworks was made by Paul Calais, who was NASA's first artist in residence, although this work uh, is being made for a company called Radiation Inc. that was making uh, pulse code modulation telemetry systems for uh, satellites uh, for Telstar, and here's uh, telecommunications in heroic mode, I love that. And then in 1966, the Surveyor spacecraft made the first telemetry-controlled landing on the moon. A uh, fact that captivated artists, artists that were working with engineers to try to figure out how to communicate with people about what technology meant. And here's this uh, lovely binary number stream. And the reason this doesn't look like uh, the Surveyor we're all familiar with that has solar panels on it, um, is because the artwork actually predates the mission by five years. It was created to recruit engineers to work on the mission. And then uh, PCM telemetry was, was used in the Apollo as well. Uh, more recent telemetry systems have gone to SMS. And uh, all I'm going to say in this uh, eight-minute format about flight systems is to just show you some good uh, satellite photos and point out that miniaturization and even at least as important, if not more important, was the thermal cooling uh, offered by the uh, introduction of um, transistor technology into space technology, uh, another Bell Labs invention. Um, and uh, people were so excited about miniaturization uh, while trying to figure out strategies of depicting it, that the Vanguard satellite is uh, affectionately depicted in many places, in many ways, as transparent. It wasn't really transparent. <laughs> and subsequent ongoing work in circuit miniaturization and the development of flexible circuits uh, helped make the human spaceflight programs possible. And we like these uh, lunar landscapes with circuit boards. Um, Ground-based systems are, of course, inclusive of all the parts of the telecommunication systems, telemetry, navigation, and instrumentation systems that remain on the ground. All the support networks that uh, keep spaceflight up. And tonight's waypoint in the history of ground-based systems is the window of time in the early 1950s when the mainframe computer came into being. Uh, prior to the 1950s, there had been just m mostly two main kinds of computers, and they had very different functions, uh, those that were dedicated and developed for scientific calculation and those that were uh, information processing machines. And the uh, when those functionalities were combined and formed the kind of mainframe computer industry that we're familiar with from the second half of the 20th century, uh, the modern mainframe uh, then did a lot to uh, contribute to ground-based uh, support of flight. And again, the, the heroic uh, engineer. Um, you know, in the popular media, it's the astronaut is in the hero's role, uh, but in art that was made for industry and to, for engineers to talk to one another, uh, often the, you know, the technology is put there. And then, uh, uh, and sometimes very creatively interpreted by artists. And one of the most um, important applications of mainframes to uh, ground-based support systems is the uh, introduction of uh, virtual flight testing. So the Saturn system, uh, launch system was the first to be fully virtually field tested and uh, associatedly uh, it had no uh, embarrassing launch pad failures of the kind that had characterized many of the uh, 
preceding launch systems. Enabling the Apollo program, the early stage of human spaceflight that we are still living in, and uh, close with a couple of heroic astronauts and and that by an artist named Ken Smith. Uh, with credit to the artists featured, many of whom remain anonymous, thanks tested, and I do write books that explain technology in this way. Thank you, Norm Tested. Everybody, audience. <laughs>